Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Data Chronicle podcast. I am your host, Scott Lachlan, co-chair of the Privacy and Cybersecurity Practice here at Hogan Levels. Today, we are discussing the international data transfers and the long-awaited decision from the European Commission finding that the new data transfer program called the Data Privacy Framework is adequate. We'll get into what that means and why it's important with my two guests, Eduardo Eusteron, who's my co-lead of the Privacy and Cybersecurity Practice here at Hogan, and Julie Swartz in our Paris office. One quick note before we get started, the adequacy decision that we're going to discuss today will have large impacts on both US and EU companies. And as a result, we're going to separate the conversation into two parts. Today, we're going to discuss the impact and importance of this decision for EU data exporters. And then a future episode will focus on US importers. So stay with us and we'll be able to cover both perspectives in good detail. So with that, maybe I can turn to our panelists here and start the conversation. And Julie, maybe I can direct the first question to you. And let's just start at the very beginning. Kind of, can you, if you can give us the European perspective about how data transfers are regulated, you know, how they, they must comply with the GDPR, that would be really helpful. Yes, thank you, Scott. And thank you very much for the invitation. This is a real pleasure be here today. So if we start from the, the basis, the basic principles of the GDPR, under the GDPR, data transfers outside of the EU are prohibited. Of course, there are exceptions, in particular, if we are transferring personal data to an adequate country, or if we are using appropriate safeguards like the standard contractual clauses, the SECs, or binding corporate rules like the BCRs. And there are, for example, specifically for the United States, a specific framework that we can use to legally transfer personal data. We first had the safe harbor, then the privacy shield. And now, as you said, we have the EU-US data privacy framework, or the DPF, as we can call it. So that means, if I'm hearing that correctly, the default is under the GDPR, you cannot transfer data to a, another country outside of the European Union, unless you have a certain exception that would apply. And what we're talking about today is one of those exceptions, not the only one, but one of them. Is that fair? Exactly. So today we are speaking of the EU-US data privacy framework, which is a mechanism adopted early in July and that facilitates data transfer from the EU to certified US companies. So this is really a key facilitator for transatlantic data economy that was eagerly expected. Yeah, so I would love to dive into what the, that program is going to look like. But before doing that, Eduardo, is the same rules and dynamic that Julie described also apply in the UK and Switzerland? Yes, absolutely. The EU, of course, was under pressure to get this done first, and that, that all the focus has been between the EU and the US. But of course, the UK, as a close partner to the EU, has been right behind, and Switzerland has always been, in a sense, mirroring the arrangement. So this is coming also in the UK and Switzerland. Got it. Okay. So then... You know, as we talked about those exceptions, Julie, the thing about the data privacy framework is, is this is not the first attempt by the EU and the United States to establish an adequate means for transferring data. Do you want to describe a little bit about the past attempts and how those have come to their end? Sure. So if we do some kind of archaeology, we can find first the safe harbor back in 98, right after the EU directive of 1995. So for the safe harbor, the US and the EU agreed on seven principles that were considered as equivalent to EU data protection standards, and that US company had to comply with to lawfully receive personal data from EU companies. But on October 2015, the CGAEU, following a complaint from the well-known Maximilian Schrems, an Austrian activist, invalidated the safe harbor. So this is what we call the Schrems 1 decision. Consequently, the EU and the US authorities had to quickly find and have a new agreement to 
uh, securely transfer personal data from the EU to the US because lots of commercial agreements were relying on the safe power. So there were a business urgency to have a secured framework. And this is what we called the privacy shield. It was adopted in 2016. But once again, on July 2020, still following actions from Maximilian Schrems, once again, the judges of the CGAU reiterated the case law and considered the privacy shield as being invalid. So once again, we have to find a new legal framework to transfer personal data from the EU to the US. So Eduardo, from your perspective, I know you have been talking a lot about how and advising clients all the time about how they can safely transfer data from the EU, the UK to the United States. And after Schrems 2, where the privacy shield was invalidated, you know, what were the available means by which you can safely transfer or lawfully transfer, I should say, of that data to the United States? So Schrems 3 effectively invalidated the arrangement, this very special arrangements that were in place between the EU and the US in relation to the privacy ship. So that disappeared and the US became once again an inadequate country from the point of view of EU transfers, which meant that you were left with the mechanisms that are available for transfers to any other inadequate countries. So it's essentially contractual solutions like the standard contractual clauses or binding corporate rules. Or if all of that fails, you are left with the derogations under the GDPR, which are the very exceptional cases where despite the lack of protection, transfers are still lawful. But of course, what SRAMS 3 left us with was very weakened approach to this type of mechanisms because the standard contractual clauses, whilst they were still valid and following the SRAMS 2 decision, what we know or what we have seen is that regulators, because of the repercussions in relation to government access to data in the US, were not prepared to accept that standard contractual clauses in isolation would be sufficient to protect the data when transferred to the US. So for the past three years, we've been in a very difficult situation in relation to transfers to the US, even if you were applying the safeguards set out in the standard contractual clauses or in other similar mechanisms. So how practically did organizations and companies try to address that dynamic? Because if I'm hearing what you're saying correctly, is that through the SHREMS related decisions, we still had a mechanism to transfer data and primarily being the standard contractual clauses, but it wasn't as simple as just signing the clauses and then everyone going on with their day. There actually had to be underlying analysis and review of the data surveillance laws, national security laws in the country where that data was flowing. That's right. And that's still the case in relation to transfers to any other countries, because as we will mention in a minute, the U.S. framework around government access to data has changed. But if you put that aside for a moment, the situation in which we find ourselves today is that if a company in the European Union relies on any of the mechanisms that are covered by what is Article 46 of the GDPR. So the mechanisms that allow to make up for the lack of GDPR type protections at the other end in the recipient jurisdiction. So if you apply those type of mechanisms, and the two most obvious ones are binding corporate rules or standard contractual clauses. So whichever of those two mechanisms you apply, you need to ensure that the protections that are included in those mechanisms make up for the lack of protection that the recipient jurisdiction may have because of the potential government access to data. That was the main aspect of the SREMS 3 decision. And therefore, when companies rely on, again, BCR or standard contractual clauses, what they have had to do over the past three years is to then, in addition to putting these mechanisms in place, undertake an assessment as to whether 
that protection was sufficient by analyzing how that protection dealt with the potential powers of the receiving jurisdiction to have access to data. Well, that's what is typically called a transfer impact assessment. So to an assessment of the impact that the local laws may have on the transfer, irrespective of what protections or what mechanisms are being used to protect the data. So Eduardo, if I'm maybe summarizing this correctly, and, and please correct me if I'm misstating it, but what I hear and what the way I've always thought about this dynamic is that the European court said, you can continue to rely on, on transfers under the standard contractual clauses, but you can't do that blindly. In other words, you can't just enter into this piece of paper and then say that that's all that you're responsible. You need to have an almost conduct an analysis or diligence or review to make sure the importer, as they're taking that data in, is actually able to comply with those terms under the laws that apply to them in their home country. Is that a fair way of thinking about it? That is exactly right. And the practical challenge that arises from that situation is that if you apply a very rigorous approach to the powers that any government has anywhere in the world to access data within their own jurisdiction, then you would find that there are hardly any jurisdictions in the world that don't have those powers. And therefore, if you consider that the mere potential for access to data by a government agency in a given jurisdiction, then that discredit the obligations or, or disable the obligations that recipient in that jurisdiction would be subject under the standard contractual clauses, then you have an unlawful transfer. And this was the decision that was made by the Irish Data Protection Commission in the recent Meta case, where it was involving Facebook. Facebook had undertaken all these measures that we've been talking about of the standard contractual clauses on, and some additional safeguards. But what the regulators agreed on was that because of the potential for access to data by US government agencies, irrespective of those protections, the data was not sufficiently safeguarded. And that is what now the data privacy framework is changing. And I think this is a really important aspect of this new framework that we need to understand. Yeah. So Eduardo, maybe that's a great place to just to start to understand what the framework is. You know, you mentioned earlier that the EU and the United States have been under incredible pressure to move this forward, given the need for commercial data transfers. And, you know, Julie, you made the point about how those have been going on for years. And in order for the economic relationships between the US and the EU to continue to work, data transfers is an important component of that. So we're now, we didn't get it right with the directive. We didn't get it right with the shield. And now third time's a charm. We're going to go after the framework. So what is the framework and how are we thinking about that from a European and UK perspective? The easiest way to understand the data privacy framework is to look at it as a framework which consists of two completely different parts. One part applies to U.S. government agencies. And the other part applies to those U.S. entities, typically companies, that are receiving data from their European counterparts or partners. Those two parts are very different. The one that applies to the companies receiving data from the EU is, a, is very similar to what applied under the privacy shield. So those are a set of principles that companies in the U.S., voluntarily agree to follow. And those principles are meant to resemble, essentially, the principles under the GDPR. So it's a way for a US company to say, I am voluntarily going to comply with the GDPR principles as interpreted in this new data privacy framework, so that when data comes to me in the US from somewhere in Europe, and the same will be uh, and by Europe, I also include the UK and Switzerland. When the data comes to me in the US, I'm going to follow these principles so that the data is adequately protected. So that's one part. And in a sense, that has always been there and that has not been very controversial. 
The important one for our purposes and to avoid another SREMS case is the one that applies to the U.S. government agencies, because this is essentially a change to U.S. law and the U.S. law powers for government agencies to have access to data that comes from, in this case, from Europe, essentially limits the way in which this agencies, call it, for example, intelligence agencies, are entitled by US law to have access to this data and essentially introduces some controls that make it more aligned with the expectations that the European Court of Justice had and that exist on the European data protection law. So it's almost like privacy shield plus, all right? It's kind of the existing privacy shield framework And we're adding to that some commitments now that are set out in an executive order from the Biden administration, committing the United States government to restraints and certain controls and processes and due process with respect to European data in particular, which long has been the subject of controversy about how much of that is protected under U.S. laws. Is that the right way of thinking about that? That's right. And the interesting thing about it is that the protections that U.S. companies needed to apply under the Privacy Shield have not really changed because there was nothing wrong with the Privacy Shield from the point of view of the obligations that apply to companies receiving data. The challenge was with the law as it existed in the U.S., surveillance law. And that is what has now changed under the data privacy framework, which is why I'm saying that the data privacy framework consists of two parts, the obligations that apply to companies that adhere to this framework and the new obligations, and this is the really important thing, that apply to U.S. government agencies to basically reduce the powers of surveillance of European data. All right. So, Julie, my question for you then is, Eduardo just described that there's been a change in U.S. law or restraints that are now put into place on the national surveillance laws and national security laws that are in place. Does that mean that the United States is an adequate country under this decision and that all European companies can transfer data because of those restraints? Or is that not what the adequacy decision says? Well, there is a slight difference to be made between what is considered as adequacy decision under the GDPR and the data privacy framework. Indeed, under the GDPR, we have a list of countries considered as adequate by the European Commission. A specific decision has been rendered for each of these countries. And the data privacy framework works like an adequate decision, so it can be considered as an adequate country, but only uh, for transfer towards entities, towards U.S. companies that are certified. So it's not for the whole country, but only for the U.S. companies that are uh, listed. There is a list of companies that, as Eduardo said, voluntarily complied with the principle of the data privacy framework and are certified under this data privacy framework. So before transferring to these U.S. companies, we have to check that they are indeed listed among this list. So, I mean, that's an interesting point, right? Because the adequacy decision doesn't cover all of the United States, right? You just made the point that there is a list. The United States has never been on that list of adequate countries. So as a result, the United States is considered to have inadequate data protection laws. And, but now maybe Eduardo, I'm interested in your thoughts. Why is it that if we just pointed out that the Biden administration put in this executive order to restrain how national security apparatus can be able to gain access to European data in a disproportionate and massive way. Why isn't now all of the U.S. now considered adequate? Why is it only those who have been certified? Because U.S. companies are not subject to a data protection framework, which is sufficiently similar to the GDPR. Maybe Californian companies are, or those that are subject to CCPA, for example. But that's to be discussed and to be assessed. But there isn't a federal data protection act in the U.S. And therefore, from that perspective, unless, again, a company in the U.S. subscribes to the data uh, privacy framework and the principles within that, those type of principles would not apply 
to you as a U.S. company. And that is what is missing under U.S. law. Maybe in, in other words, as we describe what we think that framework is going to look like, pillar one, as you described it, is the national security issues. But pillar two, kind of the certification to what was the privacy shield oriented principles, and now it's invested or embedded within the framework, is to try to cover that gap in the, the fact that the U.S. does not have that federal comprehensive data protection law. And that's really designed to try to uplift companies by agreement or by certification that they are going to comply with the principles that underlie the GDPR. Yeah. And I think what is really important to appreciate is that this is a unique situation. There is no other country in the world other than the U.S. that has this in the sense that from a EU perspective, you are either adequate because your laws resemble the GDPR or you aren't. There is no other country that has this kind of voluntary framework that a company in that country can choose to be part of. But essentially, it's the same as the standard contractual process of BCR, that you choose the companies, the, the exporter and the importer, choose to put that in place in order to enable that transfer by showing that the right level of protection is applied to the data. That's really interesting. And maybe, Julia, I'd ask you, maybe you can help me understand how this is being seen within in Europe or in, in France in particular. Does this signal that the European data protection authorities are convinced that now U.S. organizations who certify can comply under U.S. laws with the principles of the GDPR? Or is this an area that there remains disagreement? Yeah, this is a, a really good question. Actually, there is two different visions. There is the vision of EU companies that are very satisfied with the data privacy framework and eager to transfer personal data to the US because they need to. And there is a vision of authorities and in particular the European Commission that approved the privacy framework, but there are still some voices within the EU against this data privacy framework. For example, the data privacy framework was approved by the European Commission because we had the positive opinion of 24 member states out of 27. So this means that still there are three member states that did not provide a negative opinion but abstained. So there are still some hesitations. And this has to be read in light of previous opinions provided within the EU. We had the EDPB opinion and the EU Parliament opinion that were kind of providing some negative opinions. So although they are not binding opinions, this still shows that there are some voices against the DPF. So we will see because in one year we will have the first reassessment of the DPF in July 2024. And this will be the occasion for opposite voices to speak out. So let's see uh, what happened in one year. So Julie, the point of the framework is it's going to cover transfers from the EU to the United States. So Eduardo, is there something that's similar happening for the UK or Switzerland as part of other transfers coming to the US? Yes, the data privacy framework has prioritized the European Union because the strength three decision applies directly to the European Union. The UK is no longer part of the EU and Switzerland is not part of the EU. But given that effectively both the UK and Switzerland mirror by their own data protection frameworks what the, the, the law is in the EU, it is obvious that they will follow in terms of either joining the existing EU, US data privacy framework or adding themselves to the framework in some way. And in order to do so, what is also important is that the US need to determine that both the UK and Switzerland are qualifying states from the point of view of the changes that have been made to US law. That's a mere formality, obviously, in this case, but that needs to happen. And when that happens, both the governments of 
the United Kingdom and Switzerland will be able to enter into a very similar arrangement as the EU has done with the US. So it's just a formality, but it will happen in the next few weeks or months. And Edward, I've been reading about you know, what's been called as the data bridge. Is the data bridge the same as the version of the data privacy framework for the UK, or is that requiring something different? So the data breach is the British expression for what in the EU is called adequacy. If you think about it, adequacy has some condescending connotations to it because it's one jurisdiction saying to the other, you are now adequate. I think the UK following its traditional diplomatic approach, I don't know if it's traditional, but what the UK always aspired to do is to be more constructive. And therefore they are using the term data breach, but it's essentially the same. It's a recognition that another jurisdiction provides that level of protection that is essentially the same as yours. And therefore the data, when the data goes from one side of the bridge to the other, the data continues to be protected at the same level. Julie, I want to circle back to a point I think you made a moment ago. I think you had signaled that there is not universal agreement that the new data privacy framework meets the standards that are set out by the Court of European Justice and it doesn't meet the standards under the GDPR. Are we expecting additional legal challenges to this new framework? And what do you think those challenges may look like? Yes, definitely we are expecting legal challenges. NIOP, the association from Maximilian Schrems, already stated that they will do an appeal to the CGEU against the data privacy framework. And I think that one of the grounds they will raise, there are several ones, but one of them will be the appeal to the Data Protection Review Court, the DPRC. So this is the last step when EU individual considers that his or her personal data are not adequately processed uh, when transferred to the US. So there is a step to the data protection review codes that can be made, but NIOB already analyzed that this is not as appropriate, as adequate as it should be, because when appealing, the individual cannot exchange with the court. There will be no discussion. The court will only issue whether there were adequate processing of the individual's personal data. So I think that this will be one of the grants that will be raised to the CGU and might give a birth to another invalidation of the framework here, the data privacy framework for transferred from the EU to the US. Eduardo, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, there's probably very few people who follow the developments in the space closer than you. And so I'm very interested to see, you know, how you think this is going to play out over the course of the next couple of years, perhaps? Yeah. So as Julie is saying, potentially the same things that brought down the privacy shield could still bring down the data privacy framework, because those are the challenges that will be raised by possibly Schrems himself again. And therefore, whether the US government has gone far enough in ensuring that any access to data is necessary and proportional, and whether the US government has gone far enough in making sure that the redress mechanism available to European citizens is available in reality, and people in Europe can benefit from that in the same way they would benefit from a tribunal in the EU itself. That remains to be seen, perhaps. And I can see why some voices, again, as Julie is saying, are being raised to in the direction of, well, the US hasn't really gone far enough. I personally think that Given that this is the third attempt, and both the US government and the EU know very well what the standard that needs to be met is, because it was crystal clear from the decision by the European Court of Justice, I think they have taken it as far as they can possibly take it. But we will see what happens if this gets challenged. I think the reality is that Ultimately, this is now and has been for a while outside the scope of what 
our clients and the companies that we deal with can actually do, because this is purely a matter of law for, for the U.S. in the same way would be law for any other jurisdiction whose surveillance laws are tested. And therefore, from our perspective, what we need to assume, perhaps, is that the European Commission has done its job properly this time, and therefore that will hold. And what is really important, of course, is that the things that are within the control of companies, which are the protections they apply, again, whether we're talking of SCC or BCR or the actual framework itself, are there and are being upheld. And I think that's what the focus should be for most of us, perhaps not for Mark Schrems himself, but for the rest of us advising in this area. Yeah. And I want to follow on that one, Eduardo, because, you know, what I, as I understand this, right, now we have a new toy, a new legal toy to be able to address a lot of the problems that we all have been experiencing over the course of the past two to three years, you know, doing the type of transfer impact analyses that you were describing earlier, trying to go for a private company to fully understand what the national security operations are of a large nation very difficult things, very time intensive, lots of resources that come to bear. So this really feels positive that we are now have a much more seamless way of trying to transfer. But as I hear kind of both of you describing is that, well, you know, listen, we've done this two other times and we have not come to a successful resolution. And this mechanism is not free from doubt that it will continue. So how can clients, how can companies adopt and and try to both embrace the power or the value that the framework provides while at the same time, not burying their heads in the sand that this is going to last forever? Okay. So the most important thing to understand is that the adequacy decision by the European Commission has the force of law. And by that, I mean, even regulators that disagree with it will need to follow it. Even those regulators that may say, well, we wonder whether the US government has gone far enough in limiting their surveillance powers, they will need to accept that. Because the only institution that could decide whether that decision by the European Commission is not correct is once again, the European Court of Justice. So until The European Court of Justice, with a formal decision, says, I'm afraid that the European Commission got it wrong and they shouldn't have issued this adequacy decision because the US government has not gone far enough in protecting European data. Unless and until that happens, the data privacy framework is as solid as it can be. That in practice means two things. For those transfers, that rely on a recipient of the data in the US adhering to the data privacy framework itself, a transfer impact assessment is not even needed because you're relying on that adequacy decision in full. And as I said earlier, it has two parts, the part that applies to the US government and the part that applies to the recipient of the data. But there is another way in which this also is important For those organizations that rely on either standard contractual clauses or binding corporate rules for transfers to the US, in theory, a transfer impact assessment is still needed. But the advantage is that the European Commission has already done that assessment of US surveillance laws for you. And therefore you can, in a sense, blindly rely on that assessment and say, well, between the protections that our BCR or our standard contractual clauses provide and the fact that the European Commission itself has accepted that the changes to US law meet European standards, between those things, I conclude that transfers to the US are safe. So I think from that perspective, you've done a transfer impact assessment covering transfers to the US, you can just replace it with a reference to the European commission's assessment of the same. But of course, if you are transferring data to other jurisdictions, the obligation to undertake a transfer impact assessment continues to apply in exactly the same way as the day after the strength three decision was issued. So 
In other words, Eduardo, what you're saying is that in practice, while the adequacy decision you know, really relates to the to the framework and the new framework, it actually supports all three of the standard ways that you would transfer data, whether that be the framework, the standard contractual clauses, or BCRs. That's right, because again, the changes to U.S. law are relevant to all three mechanisms. Last question, Julie. So I'm a European-based company, and I want to transfer data to a company in the United States that's been certified. What do I need to do? Well, as we said, first, checking that the U.S. company is indeed on the certified list of companies, having an appropriate agreement, uh, making reference to the data privacy framework, and updated my privacy notice to inform the data subjects I will be transferring the personal data to the US that I am relying on the data privacy framework. So these are the main steps. And I will also add update any other documentation, including, of course, the record of processing activities, because I also have to mention in this document the mechanism as I am using for my data transfers. Well, it sounds like there's things to do, but it also sounds like that's much more straightforward and easier than what we have been dealing with for exactly. you know, for the past few years. <laughs> well, I want to thank you both for joining me on this podcast. This was a very helpful conversation to describe how European UK exporters need uh, can think about this adequacy decision and the new framework. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be doing another podcast with a U.S.-based team to describe what this means for U.S.-based importers of data and to go through what the implications are of certification. So please join us on that future episode. But in the meantime, Eduardo, Julie, my sincere thanks for joining us. And until next time, uh, we will see you later.